Between February 6th and 20th, 2024, thousands of Nigerians flooded major cities to protest hunger. We are hungry. This hunger is too much. Hunger, we are dying of hunger. People can no longer eat. In the previous year, 2023, it was estimated that 700,000 children died of acute hunger in Nigeria. This issue of hunger in Nigeria took a dramatic turn when on March 3, 2024, a few days after several protests, the Ukrainian government donated 25,000 tons of grain to the Nigerian government. Think about that. Why would Ukraine donate food to Nigeria? I mean, Ukraine is a poor country with a GDP of just around $200 billion in 2021, while Nigeria's GDP doubled that during the same period. Second of all, Ukraine is a war-torn country who had been fighting Russia for two years. So Ukraine giving food to Nigeria in 2024 is like a wounded cat helping a lion to find food. <laughs> But it's not just a Nigerian problem. All across Africa, food security is a noun, not a verb. Okay, I guess that's a noun everywhere, but you get the idea. The United Nations Environment Program says 200 million Africans go to sleep hungry. Africa is facing one of the worst food crises where millions of people are suffering from malnutrition. The hunger crisis of severe hunger. Extreme hunger. Yeah, acute hunger. Starvation. Starvation. Mass starvation. It's on the brink of famine. 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 Children died of malnutrition. 700 children have died. Africa faces its worst food crisis ever. According to the African Development Bank, Africa has 65% of the world's unused arable land. In addition to that, as of 2010, almost half of the entire African population worked in agriculture. To be specific, that number was 48.2%, which is a lot, especially if you compare that figure to Europe in which just 4.5% of the population works in agriculture, or the United States in which only 1.7% of the population work in agriculture. At first, you might think, mm, since almost half of Africans work in agriculture, food should be surplus and cheap in Africa. Unfortunately, the irony is that the reason why many African countries are food insecure is that too many people work in agriculture. More on this later in the video. For now, let's try and understand who are the African farmers because this understanding is needed if we must figure out why many African countries are food insecure. You see, a typical farmer in Africa is a woman who plants corn, yam or cassava on three plots of land or call it half acre of land. Half acre of land is around 22,000 square feet, or imagine the land on which this house was built multiplied by three. If this farmer is a man, then you can imagine a bigger farmland, let's say one to two acres of family land that have been passed to him through five generations. When you remember that the average farmland in the United States is 445 acres, you start seeing the problem with African agriculture. But if you've not seen those problems, let me show you three of them. Earlier in the video when I said a typical African farmer farms on a small piece of land, some people might assume that I meant that every African farmer is planting corn in his bedroom. <laughs> Instead, what I meant was that most African farmers are subsistence farmers. For example, according to this New York Times article, 65% of Sub-Saharan Africa's population relies on subsistence farming. Sub-Saharan Africa is the term used to describe all the African countries painted in green in this image. Now, you may want to ask, what's wrong with subsistence farming? Well, the first problem with subsistence farming is that 
subsistent farmers have lower yields or low productivity because they can't enjoy the economies of scale a large farm does. Lately, food prices have been on a steady rise in Algeria and some have attributed this in part to low productivity by local farmers. In sub-Saharan Africa, uh, smallholder farmers are under more pressure to produce more with the little that they have. And part of the challenges which our smallholder farmers are facing today is uh, low productivity. Low yield or low productivity means that there is a little food harvested from farms for the population, hence hunger. Another problem with subsistent farmers is that they depend on the weather or natural rainfall to grow their crops. So if rain becomes unpredictable or droughts happen, these farmers are much more vulnerable. During planting season, we don't have uh, enough rain, but the rain comes at the wrong time when we are almost harvesting. It's very, very difficult. We've had very little rain since 2017. This year we've had nothing at all. I'm selling my cows because of the drought and I've saved nothing. The two days, 25 and 26 December, are the only two days that we received the rainfall in this world, meaningful rainfall. That was the only two days. So completely we are saying in this area, we have nothing to expect. Not even a single crop a person can get from a field. Nothing at all. No rain means no crops and no food for people to buy. Subsistent farmers also lack the necessary resources for soil management, which then leads to the next big problem. What actually changed is that during our grandparents' time, the harvest was good, but these days farming is not good. You know when you overexploit the land for many years, the land's fertility is depleted. Do you remember the story I told you about this man? Let's call him Kofi. Kofi inherited two acres of land from his father, Josh. This land was originally purchased by Kofi's great-great-grandfather, and Kofi would be the fifth generation to farm potatoes on it. The problem with such land as Kofi uses it is that they are already experiencing what soil scientists would call soil degradation. The UN Food and Agriculture Organization defines soil degradation as a change in soil health status resulting in a diminished capacity of the ecosystem to provide goods and services for its beneficiaries. Let me explain all this grammar with a simple example. Let's say you buy this pair of shoes. No, 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 no. that's ugly. Find me another pair of shoes. Oh. God, my editor is too dumb to know how to find a photo of a good pair of shoes. But anyway, imagine that you bought a pair of shoes and start wearing it. If you keep on wearing this pair of shoes year after year, one day your shoes will look like this. <laughs> the same thing happens with farmland. When you keep planting on a piece of land, at some point, such land would have no nutrients remaining for your crops. Hence, your corn starts looking like this instead of this. And that means you have no food to take to the market. But you may be wondering, if all farmland gets degraded, how do Western countries manage to have so much food? To answer this question, I want us to go back to the analogy of shoes. Imagine you and nine other people bought this pair of shoes. Even though the more you use these shoes, the older they get due to wear and tear, that doesn't mean that if 10 people buy this pair of shoes, the shoes would wear out at the same rate for all 10 people, even if those people use the shoes at the same rate. For example, the person who uses waterproof spray avoids wearing the shoes through rough surfaces and polishes the shoes regularly would have his shoes longer than the person who doesn't do any of these. The person who stores his shoes in a cool, dry place away from direct sunlight would have a better pair of shoes in the long run than a moron who drops his shoes in front of his bathroom. <laughs> the same rule applies to farmlands. A farmer who observes soil testing, crop diversity, cover cropping, reduced tillage, promotion of pollinators, implement soil conservation techniques, crop rotation, etc. will use his soil productively for several decades. 
But this is a big problem for an average African farmer. I'll explain why this is the case shortly. For now, let's try and understand what some of these terms mean. Soy testing is a process used to analyze the chemical, physical and biological properties of soy to ascertain the soy's fertility, nutrient content, pH level and other characteristics. In other words, a sample of the soil you want to plant crops on will be taken from your farm. This sample would then be given to some soy scientists, agronomists or soy technicians. These people would examine the soil and come up with the facts about nutrients your soil is lacking. Then this information will be used to determine the kinds of crops you should plant or the kinds of fertilizers you will need for maximum yield. Crop diversity is a farming method in which farmers plant different types of crops or crops with different attributes on the same farm to improve soil fertility, break pest and disease cycles, and prevent nutrient depletion. For example, a farmer may cultivate rice, wheat, and legumes on the same farmland. This is called crop species diversity. By planting varieties of crops at the same time, you're helping the soil to maintain its nutrients. Another farmer may cultivate tomatoes alone, but different kinds of tomatoes like Roma tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, and beef stick tomatoes. Since each of these tomatoes has unique characteristics such as size, taste, and resistance to specific pests or diseases, they need different nutrients from the soil. Hence, some are given what others are getting. This is called varietal diversity within crop species. Another example is when a farmer plants corn, but three different corns with different genetic diversity. Some are short, others tall, etc. This is called genetic diversity within crop species. Cover cropping is plants grown specifically to improve soil health and fertility rather than for direct harvest. Think of cover crops as you do vacation, sleep or rest for humans. These three things are not directly useful for us, but they are indirectly useful because they energize and revitalize us. Radishes, marigolds, buckwheat and rye are some of the popular cover crops. At this point, I want to stop explaining all these terms because there are so many other things we have to cover in this video. Instead, I want you to have a look at this list again. A few minutes ago, I claimed that doing all of these is a big problem for an average African farmer and promised to tell you why. Here is why. Education. For smallholders, access to finance is a big challenge. It's a big challenge because a number of the smallholders are either illiterate or semi-illiterate. According to these reports by the UN Food and Agriculture Organization, 73% of Africa's rural dwellers are smallholder farmers. I must confess that this report is old, but it kind of gives us some idea of where African farmers live. You see, the majority of African farmers are rural dwellers. The problem with this is that these are the least educated people in Africa, many of whom never stepped into a school in their entire lives. If you can't even spell your name, how can you understand or observe any of the things on this list? For example, according to this report by the European Union, 50.2% of Europeans working in agriculture have medium level education. I guess that is high school. Little or no education, the majority of African farmers don't even know that any of these things exist or how to use them to keep their land healthy. As a result, millions of African farmers are planting on dead soil, which can barely yield any crops sufficient enough for the population. This is why at the beginning of this video, I told you that the irony of food insecurity in Africa is that it happens because too many people are farmers. Instead of having tens of millions of illiterate farmers who plant on dead soils because they don't know any better, what Africa needs to be food sufficient is to get 5-7% to of its educated population interested in farming. At this point in the video, you may want to ask, why can't educated Africans get involved with farming? Why can't individual Africans invest in large-scale farming? Imagine for a second that this is you. 
You are a 35-year-old Ghanaian farmer who wanted to become a successful wheat farmer, so you approached a Ghanaian commercial bank for a loan. The bank gives you the equivalent of $500,000 in local currency. With this loan, you bought 200 acres of land. You then use the remaining money to rent tractors, hire some employees, import improved seeds from Ukraine, and other general expenses for the farm. About five months later, your wheat was ready for harvest. Your farm did so well as a result of the improved seeds that you harvested 500 tons of wheat from your farm. To become a successful farmer, you decided to sell 50% of your wheat in Ghana and export the remaining 50% to some international markets. Pay close attention because it's about to get serious. When you were ready to sell your wheat, you discover that one ton of wheat is sold in the US for $300. In Germany, it's $302. In Ukraine, it's worse, $298. You're confused. You press the calculator. The figures you see don't make sense. You press the calculator again. The number is still not making sense. You think something is wrong with your calculator. You play with the numbers again on your phone. Sorry, your calculator was fine all this while. The reason why you didn't believe your calculator is that if you want to make any profit at all, you need to sell your wheat for at least $450 per ton. What's going on here? Well, the math isn't mathing. <laughs> How on earth could these American and European farmers sell their wheat so cheaply? Then you realize something rather pathetic. American and European farmers sell the agricultural produce lower than the cost price. You heard me right. Farmers in advanced economies are selling their farm produce at a lower price than what it costs to farm that produce. Then you may want to ask, why? Why are Western farmers selling their farm produce lower than what it costs to produce? Well because they receive government subsidies to do so. Well, every five years, Congress writes a new farm bill, legislation that's responsible for pumping billions of dollars into farm stuff. Well, the Senate has passed the Farm Bill, a multi-billion dollar legislative package to fund agriculture and food aid programs. The, le the legislation comes with an estimated price tag of $867 billion. The Trump administration has unveiled a $12 billion plan to help American farmers. Last year alone, we paid farmers $15 billion. The U.S. government actually pays about $25 billion a year to farmers. Taxpayers were footing about $20 billion a year to farm subsidies. Farm subsidies still cost the government $20 billion a year. Over the last 18 years, America spent almost $300 trillion subsidizing its agricultural sector. In 2021, the United States government gave $28.5 billion to American farmers as subsidies. In 2020, it was $53 billion. In the previous years, the US averaged between $20 to $30 billion in subsidies to the American farmers. Not just the US, but most developed countries. For example, in 2002, industrialized countries combined spent a total of $300 billion on agricultural subsidies of different natures. What this means is that farmers in these countries are taking their produce to the market at prices lower than the cost of production. So if you are a farmer from Africa, the international market is literally closed to you. Because while your competition in the US, Germany and France gets billions of dollars of free money every year, you can't even get a loan in your country. And not only emerging farmers are having challenges with funding, but even highly commercialized farmers are having very uh, serious challenges when it comes to funding. The agricultural sector is one of the worst performing sectors in the country at the moment. Recently, status say revealed that South Africa's economy shrank by 3.2% in the first three months of the year, citing the industry as one of the contributing factors. Some farmers struggled to up their stake in the market due to lack of access to resources. These struggling farmers often don't get the much needed assistance in funding and support programs. Then you may want to ask, 
If this guy can't sell his weed to the US or UK, why can't he sell it to his country, Ghana, or the neighboring countries Cote d'Ivoire, Burkina Faso, Togo, or Nigeria? The answer to that question is simple. Even if such a farmer wanted to sell all his farm produce in Ghana or Africa, he would still not sell at a profit because if a ton of wheat is $300 in the US, with globalization, American farmers would easily export that wheat to Ghana or anywhere in Africa for free or at reduced tariffs, then sell for just $305. This is possible because of an organization called the World Trade Organization whose objective is to reduce or eliminate tariffs, quotas and other restrictions on international trade. What then can an African farmer do? Well, sell your farm produce at a low price. Of, uh, uh, one bag, one ninety k, k, k kilogram bag of, uh, of potatoes selling at 500 shillings, um, which is imposing being equated to two, two plates of, of, of chips. And if you don't sell at a loss, then people will buy cheaper produce imported from Europe or America because imported produce is cheaper. The cost of wheat in the world market is cheaper than the cost of production in Kenya. And to Ghanaian poultry farmer said they are struggling to explore the local market due to cheaper imported chickens into the country. Every year, the West African nation imports more than $600 million worth of frozen chickens from Europe. The price is um, fair but not fair enough because if they ask us to stop eating foreign rice, we are expecting it to be a bit cheaper, but it's not. Majority prefer the imported one because of the price. It's cheaper as compared to uh, the locally made ones. Many potential customers are buying imported frozen fish instead as they are cheaper. Parler de dumping en ce qui concerne donc ces importations massives de poulet congelé parce que les prix en fait de de revient de cession de ces de ces poulets congelés sur le marché eh bien noix est tellement faible par rapport au coût de production locale que la production locale ne peut pas concurrence. The American NGO National Center for Policy Analysis wrote this about Western food subsidies. These subsidies encourage overproduction. Markets are flooded with surplus crops that are sold below the cost of production, depressing world prices. Countries with unsubsidized goods are essentially shut out of world markets, devastating their local economies. Since most African countries can't afford to subsidize their farmers, those farmers are essentially shut out of the world's market, which unfortunately includes their country's markets, devastating their local economies because when citizens of your country don't buy your maize or wheat because the imported maize and wheat are cheaper, then you won't continue farming. And when most farmers in a country don't continue farming, at some point, somebody will have to starve to death. That's why the International Monetary Fund estimates that eliminating various agriculture subsidies in rich countries would raise global welfare by 100 billion US dollars. Now you ask me, why can't African countries ban the importation of food to encourage local farmers? Yeah, in theory, that makes sense. And in fact, Almost every African country tries to ban some food importation at some point or another. Ghana has banned with immediate effect all tilapia imports. Kenya has banned the importation of brown sugar and cancelled all importation licenses. And Sudan has imposed a temporary import ban on selected foods. In Algeria, President Abdelmajid Teben has banned the import of meat. Malawi has banned the import of unmilled maize. Fruits, vegetables and fish are on the list of banned imports in Sudan. Yesterday, the Namibian government announced that it was suspending poultry imports. If, as a government, you ban the importation of rice, Rice, for example, since your country is yet to figure out how to farm enough rice for your citizens, the price of rice will soar by 500%. Average people can no longer afford rice. Then you start hearing this. We suggest a reopening of the land borders to allow food, cement, and other essentials to come in. Let them open the borders because Nigerians depends 40% on goods that come from borders, especially is as a concern is foodstuffs. Let them open up the borders. Before they will close the border, they should give us alternatives. No food open border first. No, the president said there is what enough food to feed every Nigerians. If you open border, there will be 
reduction in prices of so many things. There is competition. Listen, let me tell you, if you open for that, I decide to bring the rice at my own rate and sell it. You will be, and rice will be cheaper. You know why? Because when you bring your own, now that is 70, somebody will bring 60, somebody will bring 50, somebody will bring 40. That is what works. If you refuse to listen to this gentle advice, do you remember the first clip I showed you at the beginning of this video? That's one of the protests in Nigeria. Millions of your citizens will flood major cities and if care is not taken, another Arab Spring or a military coup will soon take place. The last time I checked, every politician was afraid of being kicked out of power. About 12.8 million people in South Africa have gone to bed hungry this week alone, all while the country wastes 10.3 million tons of food per year. I mean, nearly half of all crops harvested in Kenya are thrown away or lost due to poor handling and storage. This, no doubt, is a major contributor to food insecurity and high food prices, which consistently plague the country. They we basically looked at the tomato value chain. We found that in some areas, up to 50% of our produce is lost, uh, mainly from handling and uh, during transportation. With the rising insecurity in Algeria, some farmers in the north have been forced to abandon their farmlands for fear of being attacked. With few of them tilling the soil, Nigerians are already feeling the pinch as food prices keep rising to the rooftops. The spread of violence and insecurity to parts of the country where the communities rely on farming means that they can no longer do that because they cannot access their farms even if those farms are less than three kilometers away. Across the continent, extreme weather caused by climate change is upending people's lives, forcing them to flee their homes and pushing millions into hunger and starvation. There are grim new figures from the World Meteorological Organization. They say Africa is warming faster than any other place in the world. And with that, agricultural productivity is declining. As we round off this video, I must admit that many things I ought to cover in the video are not covered. The reason for that is because I don't want to make a video that's 29 hours long. <laughs> Issues like communal clashes, conflicts, wars and terrorism, for example, are contributing factors to food insecurity in Africa because farmers can't go to the farm in an environment that's not safe. Climate change is another big issue because Africa is getting warmer than the rest of the world. Flooding, inconsistent rainfall and droughts are all more frequent due to climate change. The lack of necessary infrastructures to transport, preserve and process farm produce is another reason for food insecurity in Africa, as well as the lack of access to improved seeds. Now, even though it's difficult to cover everything comprehensively in this video, I feel that I've touched on the foundation of the problem of food insecurity in Africa. In the first part of the video, I talked about how most farmers in Africa are farming on a little piece of land. It's called subsistence farming. It leads to low yield and the farmers are susceptible to nature, unpredictable rainfall, flooding and droughts. Such farmers are also less likely to be educated, so they lack knowledge about soil management as explained with these bullet points. This then leads to dead soil and when you plant on dead soil, I gave an example of how you get this maize instead of this. In the second part of the video, I talked about how Western subsidies discourage investments and mechanized farming in Africa because if America, for example, is going to give $20 billion of free money to its farmers next year and you're in Cameroon not even having access to a bank loan, there's no way you want to compete with American farmers, even in your country. Does that mean that it's over for Africa? Does that mean that Africa will forever be hungry? No. Even though the journey to food sufficiency will be difficult for most African countries, a few countries are already on the way to achieving that. A good example is Rwanda. If you want to know how Rwanda changed its agriculture sector and overcame many of the barriers we talked about in this video, click on the video by your left. We love you. Thanks.